All right, well, thank you, everyone, and welcome to the power of YouTube, unlocking the power of advertising and programming. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here. I'm Tracy McCormick. I am thrilled to be your moderator today. Um, McCormick Media Services is a modern media sales training consultancy. So what that means is we train marketers and salespeople on all the new modern media platforms, including YouTube, for those that want to know more about YouTube. Now, uh, I'm joined today by a very elite group of experts on YouTube. They're going to make this a really terrific experience for you. Now, to my first to my left is Mike um, Pusateri. Mike, uh, at heart, is really a visionary and an entrepreneur. He actually started creating companies at the age of 11 in Silicon Valley, way before that was cool. And today, he's the founder of a company called Bent Pixels. So Bent Pixels started in 2009 and literally grew up in social video. Bent Pixels has a software that helps companies and multi-platform networks really manage and optimize their audiences. So we are very lucky to have Mike here today on the panel. Please help me give Mike a, a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, to Mike's left, I have Adam Hammer. Uh, Adam was creating digital video before digital video was even born. He's a film school graduate. He's a writer, director, producer, overall content creator. He really got his start at a small network you may have heard of called Adult Swim, but his own YouTube channel has over 100 million views, and he works with all kinds of big brands like Target and uh, Neutrogena and Jack Daniels and many more. Today, he's a lead producer at Complex News LA, where he's produced more than 700 pieces of content this last year. Again, we are very lucky to have Adam on the panel. Please give me a big round of applause for Adam. And to Adam's left, we have Cliff Baldridge. Now, Cliff is a new media entrepreneur. He created a very, very successful, multi-award winning global media network called Santa Barbara Arts TV, SBA TV. It has almost a billion unique viewers worldwide. He's a 10-year partner of Google and YouTube, and today he's an executive producer at the YouTube uh, Space LA production house, which I know a lot of you are interested in how you get in on that, how you start working on that. So uh, Cliff's going to tell us more about that as we go on. Please give me a big round of applause for Cliff Baldwin. Okay, so gentlemen, I thought it would help our audience to, for one to two minutes, just tell them how your current role is involved and engages with YouTube so that they have a better perspective of where you're coming from. Sure. Um, Bent Pixels is focused on building technology around social video and helping those that are in the social video space. So day to day we work very closely around monetization and optimization, um, specifically on YouTube and other platforms as well now like Facebook. So we're, we're in it very deep. We're in the technology very deep as it relates to the back end of YouTube. Um, the analytics, obviously managing a CMS. So our software is really um, is, is built around the workflow and the business of social video. And we'll talk more about that, I think, as we go. Great. Thank you. Adam? Uh, currently, uh, I have left Complex. Oh, uh, sorry <laughs> about that. I started a, uh, a comedy news series that uh, we're just kind of testing right now on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, at Complex, I help grow their YouTube channel from 80,000 to currently 800,000 in just over a year, um, just using uh, different techniques with SEO and analytics and, uh, and really uh, knowing who our audience was and, and marketing to them with our videos. So, and then, yeah, I produce a bunch of other shit too. Great. Cliff, that's what you're going to get today on this panel, that kind of uh, reality. Still doing my YouTube creation, 10 years now. Uh, it's primarily moved from news and entertainment to family entertainment, and I just started a new A-list celebrity uh, interview and celebrity channel with over a 1,000 hours I'm uploading of celebrity content. I'm a YouTube Space LA producer for three years now, so actively involved in the YouTube space. And I'm also a YouTube business consultant, especially helping women and women entrepreneurs. And I manage channels for YouTube, too. Awesome. Thank you. 
Now listen, today's panel is going to be a little different than other panels you may have been to because this isn't a monologue. I really want this to be a dialogue. We're going to ask questions to the audience just like we're going to ask questions to the panel. I hope you'll engage with us, raise your hand, answer. You don't have to wait till the end to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand and I'll make sure I, I get to you, okay? Everybody okay with that format? All right. So in that vein, let's start off and talk about I want to ask a question to the audience. So how many of you guys are actively using YouTube? By a show of hands, on a regular basis, how many of you are actively using YouTube? All right, so here's my question. And I want you to you know, yell it out or let me know, raise your hand. How are you using it? Are you using it like a how-to video uh, search engine? Are you really following PewDiePie and all these other influencers? Are you getting your entertainment? How are you using it today? All of the above. Anybody else? The people that said they're using it, how are you using it? You're using it for promotion. Anybody else using it in a different way? I have a TV show on Time Warner, so I'm, I'm taking all of that now and putting it on YouTube. So distribution platform. Yeah, it's all celebrity driven, so using the advantage of online uh, clicks, which isn't available on TV. So. All right, great. Excellent. Great. I'm glad we got some different things. How about you? Research and All right. Me too. I, I, I got a breathalyzer the other day to help me with my cough, and I'm like, I'm going to go to YouTube and see how to use this thing because the doctor did not tell me, right? So my qu first question then is for Mike. I think people aren't really sure what the business of YouTube is. How does it work? Some people are creators. Some people are companies. Some people are solo players. Some people are benefacting from videos going viral. So there's something like amateur, semi-pro, pro creators. How does the business work? What do I sign up? How do I get some views? How do I get my cut? What's the business piece of this thing? So from a just some perspective of the space I think is important to start out. Um, you're talking about a, a $13 billion subset of a $200 billion market, which is part of the larger online video space. So it's really early from, from that perspective, and I think that's important to, to understand. But the business of YouTube, I'll give, it, uh, I'll give the perspective from those doing business on YouTube like multi-channel networks, um, you know, from from that standpoint, it's it's really two pieces. It's it's about the passive revenue and the active revenue, and that applies as well to, to the individual creator. So the passive revenue would be something that um, you may know about. Uh, it's it's AdSense revenue, and it's really around um, uploaded individual uh, auction views that take place on your individual channel, and the revenue associated with that. And then um, the other piece of that is content ID or claimed content that is um, around uh, what's being created. So there's revenue associated with both. So those are the two pieces of the passive side of the business. Um, it's in, in many MCNs case, that's not the primary source of revenue. It's an important source of revenue, but it's not the primary, it's the active side. And that's where the brands come into play. So uh, brand integrate, branded content, that's where larger CPMs are really important um, to driving a lot more revenue from And that so to side. get some of this passive revenue, if you're an individual creator, you need to be in the X number of millions of views to even see a scratch on the surface. Like, What, what would that number be? You know, real real numbers that we typically use for every million views is about a thousand dollars. Typically, that's going to be that's going to be directly to the creator. That's post split. That's based on a, a typical MCN split as well. Mm. So, that's a that's a general general guideline that can be used. Thank you. Yeah. So. But on the active side, I think um, that's an important part of doing business on YouTube. It's a growing piece. Some of you have heard, you know, Brian Robbins at Awesomeness TV has done an amazing job with taking content creators that have done well on YouTube, that have done well on Vine, and helping them transition to TV or to movie. That's an important gray area. That's part of that active revenue. And that's a really big piece that I think um, a lot of creators are obviously interested in. They want to work with an MCN that has those relationships, has the ability to help them transition from YouTube to traditional media, and, um, and widen, widen their, obviously, their reach. So. And then, Adam, when we talk about the YouTube audience, 
Like, I'm not understanding, and I think our audience might want to know more about how that's segmented. So is the YouTube audience everyone, or is there like a clear demo, like a Pinterest, and what kind of opportunities exist for audience segmentation on YouTube? Is it, there's not like a, a YouTube, the YouTube audience is kind of everyone, but depending on the content, they're going to attract a certain audience. Um, the audiences that I've dealt with when I was at 17 and Complex Magazine, they were two completely different audiences. Um, but they did, they did uh, tend to trend young. Um, they like to interact with the content creators. They like to feel like they're part of the show. Um, it, YouTube sort of brings this this sense that, that you're involved and that you can be there, where TV is this sense that is kind of unattainable. So that's, that's where we've seen like the most popular rises in the channels is people watching, going, hey, I could do that. I could do really bad edits and <laughs> make pretty bad jokes, and that's, that's me, that's entertaining. That's, this guy reminds me of me and my friends. That's why I want to consume this. And that's where I've seen the success it, when you think about... Um, when you think about like some of the some of the channels that are more popular, um, but there's different kinds of success too. Like BuzzFeed would have a, a way broader audience than like Vice, and those are two very successful YouTube channels um, that go after two different audiences. BuzzFeed. So the audience basically is at anyone. You can reach anybody yeah. that you want to reach by whatever your content is. Yeah, if you have something that people want to hear, then they'll. Listen. Right, yeah. Like the marketing part, got, though, is the key, though, right? Yeah, uh, the marketing part, yeah. I mean, you have to have a good word of mouth. You have to have, like, call to actions. You have to, like, tell your audience what you want them to do to promote you. Um, but you have to have something to say or nobody gives a shit. I don't know. That PewDiePie guy doesn't seem to have much to say that resonates with me. Yeah, but, but you're not the... number the, one guy. Yeah, you're not the, the target demo. Yeah, <laughs> far away from 16 to 35, I yeah, suppose, yeah. is the issue there, right? Probably yeah. like 14, 14 to 16. Right. More right. <laughs> So Cliff, let me ask you something. What are the available ad products on YouTube? So is one more beneficial to advertisers or content producers or viewers? What are the ad opportunities? Well, I got a list here because it's kind of growing, so oh. I'll just run you through it all. Great. Um, the, the basic ads on the right of the YouTube video is the display ad. It's just the ad on the right, and it can be just a picture. It can even be like a video or movie trailer. Then there's the semi-transparent overlay, which is uh, comes up in the middle of the video. It's like 20% of the video screen. It's what's on the bottom of the video. Then we have the prime video, the prime ads, which are the skippable and non-skippable ads. So those are the pre-rolled, the ones before the videos and after the videos, primarily before the videos. They're either skippable, where you can skip them, or non-skippable. And then the newest ad formats, which are really exciting and emerging, are they just came out with TrueView for shopping, which is a really powerful. It's going to be exploding, like coming up in the fall and the winter and then the spring, because they've connected the Google Merchant Center with the new card system, which is the annotations that used. To, they have annotations on YouTube, and they've created this card system because the annotations don't work on mobile, so it's not interactive on mobile. The annotations. So now with the card system, you can have uh, people like um, do different things like go to your playlist through the mobile devices. So on top of the card system, uh, Google just came out with the true view for shopping, which actually connects products with individual videos. And then even cooler is um, 360 VR ads. So they're just starting to come out because now on your YouTube channel, you know, on, on YouTube you can go to like your mobile and you can scroll around and see 360 degrees. So just very few companies like Nexus and Nissan are starting to do 360 ads mm -hmm. that come up like pre-rolls before the videos. And you know, no one's really doing this yet. It's just emerging. And then just to let you know, a couple other uh, kind of products are the, the branded entertainment is key where you have like a YouTuber and a key ad doing branded entertainment commercial basically but then at YouTube Space LA um, it, they're doing lots of live events so sponsored live events especially at YouTube sponsored happy hours at YouTube where companies are bringing their products to new YouTubers um, those are really cool new 
kind but of so ad format. So when formats. you have that skippable ad, you know the one, you all know the one I mean, the one that says, you can skip <laughs> this ad in yeah. five, yeah. four, three, two, and you are all waiting for the second where you can hit that skip ad part. Does that, they only have the five seconds because that counts as an ad for them, right? That counts as a view, a viewable impression. Yes, yeah, some of them are <laughs> skippable and some of them are not <laughs> skippable. Right, but that can, as long as you hit, waited till the skip part, it still counts as an ad for the advertiser? No. Uh, no, oh, no, I'm it does not. I'm pretty sure you have to be through the entire ad. I yeah. see. I see. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Good to know. So, you know, Facebook, because of the number of users it has, this billion plus number of users, clearly YouTube is the second largest search engine. There's a lot of discussion about what's the difference between doing business on YouTube and doing business on Facebook. And I know Mike can give us a really good answer to that question. Yeah, the you know, doing, first of all, it's around the creator and the content itself. For, for YouTube, the content is really created, um, uh, it's, it's around optimizing the individual videos as well as the channel. And optimizing the channel and creating content focused on the vertical that that channel is focused on. And on Facebook, it's really about the stream. It's autoplay content, and it's also, there's no audio, right, that shows. So you've got to create content that works with that viewer. It's a different viewer. So um, obviously a massive opportunity. You're looking at you know 1.4 billion users on Facebook, 1.1 billion on YouTube. Two massive social video opportunities, and um, so that's that's obviously um, you know super super but exciting. But on Facebook, the content comes to you, right? It I don't does. have to go and do anything right. to get it. No, and that leads to the data. I mean, that's really the data piece that Facebook is bringing some really heavy, heavy value. Um, there's going to be a tremendous amount of user data that's not necessarily surfaced from YouTube. It's going to be surfaced on Facebook. So brands and advertisers are going to be able to really, really target their audience. And that's going to make a massive, massive impact on in YouTube, terms of you engagement. Can't do the same thing. You don't not have user close. data. You have engagement data, but you don't have individual user. That's really detailed, tight demographic. You do have demographic data, but it's a lot more targeted on Facebook. I mean, I don't, I'm sure if you guys all have business Facebook pages and use the audience insights of a Facebook page, you can say, I only want Canadians who smoke cigarettes, yeah. who um, fly on Delta, and who are between the ages of this and this to see this video, right? Or to, I, I want to target those people, which I think is a huge advantage for Facebook, right? It's huge. It's huge. And, and the big questions that are coming up that um, I think a lot of people are asking are really around, number one, the partner program is in beta and it's starting, but what does that look like? In other words, we know the split is 55%, but what are the CPMs going to be? I've heard some really super low CPMs. I've heard there's going to be opportunities for really, really high CPMs. That's a, obviously your creator. You want to understand that. And I think, too, the rights management component is going to be key. You know, YouTube has spent years and they have hundreds of engineers working extremely hard on content id content id is a very effective rights management tool to be able to find your content that's being copied and everybody's heard of freebooting if it's a big issue on facebook how is that we've had direct conversations with your engineering team and they're working really hard on it they've got super smart people obviously um, at facebook the that effort is going to be very very important and is going to tell um, a lot about how facebook video is going to be able to directly compete or not with YouTube. Well, let's talk about the experience then. Okay, so now a lot of people have, anybody here have Apple TV or Roku or Wii, right, that you're using on your regular TV, right? You're attaching these devices and now watching them on your regular TV. I don't know that too many people are looking at their Facebook feed or maybe they have a smart TV, right? Not too many are losing their Facebook feed on that, but the experience of watching your YouTube content on that might change everything, right? So this this is a question really for the whole panel. Does anybody have any thoughts on how the Roku's and the Apple TV's and the Chromecast will maybe make this a better experience than Facebook because of the way the content can be enjoyed? For YouTube? <coughs> on... Yeah, for, and for users. Yeah, and yeah, I think like being able to get it on more devices is also just going to be able to expand how people enjoy it like right now a lot of youtube users like in my analytics that i've seen it's like 50 50 mobile and computer um i don't even think people are consuming that much youtube on their televisions oh. i think it's a different it's available it's there um but i think when you sit down to watch the tv 
you you want it to be more of like uh, it's like a big sporting event or it's like a movie or something like right. that. YouTube is more like eh, if it sucks, I'll move on. Oh, right. And if you gotta if you gotta deal with the Apple TV remote to oh this sucks, I'll move on. Right. Yeah. Both 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 platforms are really focused on mobile. I don't know if you guys were at VidCon, but there's you know. Suzanne Wojcicki was mobile, mobile, mobile. I mean, at the end of the day, they're focused on optimizing for mobile and making sure that that experience is done very, very well, you know, um, to the point of the lean back in Roku and Apple TV. There's no question it's available, but ultimately, you know, it's a mobile experience right now um, for both platforms, and they're going to keep making sure that that's going to be, you know, very, very good for the, for the viewer. So I, have you guys I do have to confess, though, I do watch exercise videos on YouTube on my TV. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's hard to do mobile. <laughs> yeah. Pilates? Yeah, my Pilates. Pilates. Yeah. Have you guys heard about, um, just was recently announced that um, YouTube is going to have this now YouTube Red, right? It's a subscription, uh, paid, ad-free subscription service, $9.99 a month, right? And it's called YouTube Red, and it's fundamentally going to change the way users and content creators work. Now, YouTube is saying, we want to make a, uh, what was the exact word they said? They want to amplify and have a uninterrupted experience for their users. So my question for the audience is, think about this a second before you answer. How many people really want to have an uninterrupted user experience that you're willing to pay $9.99 a month for to use YouTube, or would you rather just wait on the button that says five, four, three, two, one, skip ad for free? Which one? How many people are willing to pay $9.99 a month for their YouTube? Okay. All right. So that... <laughs> I think that's a, that's I think a that's point. an important question. There's yeah. no 16-year-olds in here. So what were you going to say? I watch a whole lot, and it's odd because I work for a network, so I love content ID, and I love catching other people stealing our content. But if it's on YouTube, I'll wait for the button. I'm not paying. Me too. I'm not, but as you said, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not in the demo. Although, they have said that it's everybody. But so now for the panel, what do you guys think? Cliff, you go first. Well, also on uh, Apple iTunes, it's going to be twelve ninety nine because Apple's taking a fee, so it's going to be more expensive. Um, really, like the multi-channel networks, which I'm not really want to promote too much, unless you're a really high-level user, unless you have your built-in millions of audience subscribers, you know, uh, I don't know if people are going to be willing to... to pay because like PewDiePie has a seriously dedicated fanatical audience who's willing to pay for original content like on Netflix. But you know, do you think it works as a subscription model, Mike? I mean, how much can people really pay for? I already pay for Netflix and Hulu and my cable and Pandora. I mean, how much can people really pay for? So perspective, right? There's 69 million subscribers paying for Netflix. There's 1.1 billion users on YouTube. YouTube. So if you're in the business of YouTube, you need to convert about 6% of those. So did 6% raise their hand? Maybe. I don't know, this is not necessarily representative of the overall user base, but the point is, overnight they could have a business which is netflix is an amazing business right everybody can and they've agree got data. they've got massive amount they're, they're an analytics and data company at the end of the day this is an amazing thing if you're a creator because if six percent converts you're going to have an by the way that revenue that is going to be increasing from the subscription service is being passed to the creator so the creator on YouTube is going to be able to benefit in that in a very dramatic way. Long tail, very different than, than look, Netflix, you can't compare Netflix directly to Facebook. It's a, it's a totally different ballgame in terms of the quality of content, and et cetera. But at the end of the day, um, um, I think it's, it's, it's a tremendously smart business move. So Adam, do you think people, let's, if they're 16 to 35, they don't, have the mean, they don't have the means to pay for everything. Do you think they might, even though Netflix is totally different, as Mike is saying, do you think people will substitute something else? Will this hurt Hulu, let's say? Like, who's the one that people you think would drop off of so they could take that 9.99 and now pay for YouTube? 
I think that they'll just eat the cost. If they're going to pay for it, they're going to pay for it. Um, I don't know that they will pay for something they're getting for free right now. Vessel is trying to do a paid subscription thing, and I don't have any insight on it. I just know it's happening. Um, and I know that there's content creators on YouTube who are for it. There's content creators on YouTube who are against it. There's not really a big rallying cry of support of, great, somebody's coming to help us. I don't know, I don't know how they'll react to the YouTube $10 a month charge. Um, me, personally, I would only pay for it if it was a premium tier or it replaced something that I got from, uh, like, Amazon Prime or something. Do you which, think music... Um, yeah. Because music's a big piece yeah. of it. Do you think music would be worth it? That's the question, right? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 999, it has to compete with Spotify. It right. has to compete with right. Apple Music. And yeah. it's got to compete with Tidal, which isn't much of a competition at this point. Yeah. But it's, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's tough to, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that the 999 would appeal to the PewDiePie user. But yeah, like maybe Vivo. Now, Cliff, you were, uh, from a content creator's perspective, Mike was talking about that they're going to get, like, a bigger cut. Can you talk a little bit about what that deal really means for these content creators? Well, one, re one more reason why you may want to buy into it is because they're bringing in other services into it where you can get more music. And I think you can get access to, like, the Google Kids. Play music store, right. too. Right, right. So it's, it's like people I've talked to said, oh, I'm going to buy it because... I, I, I'm already paying the same price for another service on Google, you know, but can you repeat? Re the question is with the content creators, um, it all comes down to um, the, the YouTube ad money is just the AdSense money is really just the ads are getting saturated. The market's getting saturated. There are not enough ads for the videos. And so really going to have to go to outside means like the sponsored video markets growing and exploding. So that's just key right now. All right. So that's a really good segue to talk about this next piece. So let's talk about advertising here. How many of you guys, let's be, let's be honest here, how many of you guys are skipping the ads when you get the chance to skip them? By a show of hands, how many really are skipping the ads? Okay, so that's almost, almost 100% of the people in the room, okay? Is there ever a time, by a show of hands, is there ever a time when you want to see the ad? Or if you have an answer, I'd love to hear it. Uh, sir with the glasses. And so even if it's something, it comes up as a pre-roll, but if it's something you're interested in, you'd be willing to watch the whole ad. Yeah, if it's something pushable, sure. And you, Seth, in the back, you had your hand raised too? Yeah, if I find some ad that's relevant, something that I could be adding. So it doesn't have to necessarily be clever. Like, I only watch the Geico ads. Have you ever seen the one with the chicken on the train and the song goes <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I love this one, right? The chicken keeps the, sending you, pictures home. You can't home. skip a lot of those Geico ads. I mean, ads, listen, right? that's, like, <laughs> that's like genius, right? Yeah. I'll watch one of those ads any day of the week. So, but now we're going to talk about ad blocking, which is if you have, if you've been living under a rock, you haven't heard about ad blocking, which is the hottest topic happening right now. So technology companies, this has been around, this is not new, right? This ad blocking has been going on and everybody's been like pretending this was going to go away, including the IAB. And what's happened, listen, they, they know we don't want the ads. That's why they give us the chance to get off of it in five, four, three, two, one, right? 100% of the people in here said they don't want to have the ads. So the question is now to the panel, what now? Right? What, what, what now? How are the content creators and the advertisers going to respond to this? Because the gig is up now. So what is the, what is the answer here? Sponsored content. Branded in, entertainment. Yeah, branded, integrated um, shows and series and stuff. So yeah. does that mean that native advertising is the future of video marketing then? Is that it? Is that the simple answer? Mm, I don't know. I think there's some ads that are fine. Like the Geico ads, you can't skip. They're 15 seconds. They give you a little joke. You don't get mad at it. You're not sitting through a 60 second ad wanting to click that skip now button and not being able to just to watch a 60 second video, 20 seconds of which is an end card. Like you, you need the ads need to kind of respect the consumer, I guess, on YouTube a little more. I think Geico kind of has a good, like from the ads that I'm running across, Geico jumps out at me as somebody that like respects the viewer's time, respects that they're not there for the ad. Um, they get their message across really quick, get a little joke, and now I can watch PewDiePie. <laughs> right. 
What do you guys think? I mean, the consumers, you know, the viewer has spoken and they don't like it. So the the advertiser needs to adjust. I mean, it needs to adapt to that that demand that's going on in the marketplace. And I think TrueView obviously hit a note. It's a vast majority of the ad formats on YouTube. You're seeing it across other platforms. Um, you know, shorter form ads are going to be probably part of the equation more and more. I think the five second ad that Vessel's doing is really smart. So there's going to, different formats are going to have to come into play. So. Well, how many of you guys have downloaded a, um, an ad blocker? So not that many. I mean, you probably more of you would if you would bother to make the time for it, right? If you really hate it, if you're not watching them, what's keeping you from downloading the ad blocker? You have to pay? It's just four or five seconds, and then you can skip it, so it's, you know, yeah. it's very easy. I'm with you, so maybe this is just a lot of terror. It's outside of YouTube. It's primarily, I think, an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure That's true. Some of, most of our parents like were skeptical of the, of the clicker when the right. clicker came out. Right. I can just get up and turn, you know, turn them off. So yeah, that's except that's YouTube really has everyone. And 48% of people, they say, or no, it's increased 48% the amount of ad blockers that people are downloading. I'm just not sure if it's terror that's going on through the ad community or if people really of all ages are, if it grew 48%, that ain't nothing. Like, and there's not, those people aren't all under the age of 35. I think there's something to this thing, maybe. I don't know. I think ad blocker is really going to devastate a lot of YouTubers in the near future. And sh sh shorter ads, the better. You know, a shout out, a 15 second, a 30 second that you can't skip. Stuff like that, I think, will be the best option. But really, coming down to more sponsored videos in the future. Those are going to be way more expensive. I mean, right? It costs the money to produce the ad and to buy the media, but buying a sponsored ad and created good sponsored content is going to be more expensive, no? It's running about a uh, hundred dollars for a thousand views right now. Uh -huh. Yeah. And Adam, what do you think is the biggest misconception that advertisers have about YouTube? I don't know. I haven't talked to any advertisers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think uh, just judging by the ads, they, they think the audience is, has just like moved over from TV. But you, you, you expect, like you don't even expect to watch commercials on TV anymore. <laughs> like you, you use a DVR, you fast forward through things, or you use Netflix or HBO. Um, Hulu's big thing right now is, hey, now you can get us with no ads. People don't like ads. Um, but the ads that I see quite often um, in pre-roll on YouTube feel like they belong on TV and aren't really talking to a YouTube audience, which is more interactive than TV. Well, you know, nobody mentioned this, but Hulu's uh, answer to ad blocking is, <laughs> you can't see that. You can't. You want to see the content? No, thanks. You want to have to watch the ad in order. You cannot. If you're going to use an ad blocker, you cannot watch our content. Now, that could be an angle that other people choose to go, right? Even YouTube. Yeah. That's, a, that's a, an important issue that is being worked on pretty hard right now. So yeah. do you think then, is a, a, is a brand better off to use YouTube to create and distribute their own content or to buy an ad around it? Have you guys seen the Squatty Potty Creative? Have you seen it? Oh, yeah. It's hilarious <laughs> and it's got four, how many, Vanessa, how many did it have yesterday? 400 million or something? Four million. Four million. Four million views of this little particular piece of creative. Cliff, you've seen it. So our it's, advertisers, it's so cute. <laughs> our advertisers, better off then spending good money to make something like that, or to put their ad around programming and content where people are saying, "Well, it's only four or five." Well, seconds. the thing is, they're doing both. Like I didn't hear it all about Squatty Potty. And then it came up in my Facebook feed, and I thought it was really cute and funny. And so then I wanted to know, well, how can I go deeper into finding more about that? And it takes you right back to YouTube, basically, because that's where they that's where originally it wanted it to go. But people are free booting, and the other they were doing an ad campaign, I guess, on Facebook. But it, you know, it's it, it's just it's cute, and I mean, it's both really. The answer to your question is both because I'm seeing now because I went and visited Squatty Potty now all I get are Squatty, Squatty Potty they are ads, the unicorn right? oh, you've been ads retarded. everywhere yeah yeah <laughs> so Mike how does somebody make their programming attractive to advertisers so if these guys want to attract advertisers with their content how do they do it 
How do they attract advertisers to their content? I think, you know, working closely with the advertiser is an important first step if you can, whether that's through, um, you know, directly, ideally, or, or with an MCN. That should be one of the primary roles of an MCN is bringing the brands to the table. There's a lot of platforms now as well where you can interact with brands directly which I think is something that uh, everybody that's creating content should look into. You can, Isaiah is one. Um, There are others that allow the brands to come in and actually select the demo that they want to target. Those individual creators get notifications. Here's the requirements to be able to to go out and and, uh, participate in the brand's campaign. So that's that's an important, I think, uh, way to use technology for a creator um, to get in that game. And how safe is it then for a brand to advertise on YouTube? I mean, sometimes I see some inappropriate content with a Toyota ad, and I think, oh, yikes, they're going to be so upset that they ran next to this. How safe is it? Yeah, if, you, if you're putting out content that can be consumed by like a you know, primetime TV audience, then advertisers seem to be okay with it. Um, you start crossing too many lines, then you're only going to be able to sell like pre-roll media, and it's going to be harder for you to really. Because you don't know where it's going to go, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, all the branded content that I've done, we've we've already had series established that we reached out to brands that would fit the series. Like when I was on, when I did a daily show for Seventeen, that was like makeup tips and DIYs and how tos. Um, and uh, it was very safe. It was easily consumable. They were only like a minute long. And if it was brought to you by Target, um, we, could, we could do like an outfit of the day that was all Target clothes. And Target seemed happy. The viewers didn't seem like they were getting an ad shoved down their throat. Um, it felt very like organic to be watching it. And those, those kind of branded pieces... The authenticity is right. key, right? Yeah. Like oh, you yeah. can't put yeah. out anything that's phony or where no. all you're doing is talking about the brand. It has no. to be something that's real and well thought out. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah, these YouTube viewers, like, um, there isn't one YouTube viewer, but all of them seem to have this, uh, this desire for authenticity authenticity a connection so if they feel like oh you sold out then yeah. you now get lit I'm... up in the comments oh yeah <laughs> you get all burned. right so then that's exactly this is a really great segue to talk about influencer marketing and these influencers are you guys following anybody here following the michelle fans and the pewdiepies and the rest of these big names are you following these people on any i know we're not i know we're not the exact demo but you know i'm with you i'm with you 100 percent. my my sample size is a little not representative I, i'm with you but is anybody following any of those people any any of the influencers anyone who you follow Oh, you do. And I, I, I don't know how I was for a long time and I'm like I have no idea what this is but I got to delete it and it, what, who are you following oh okay good well then this then then this question should be interesting for you so my question is so advertisers are blown away now but these influencer marketing it's the new shiny thing over here and they're all like we're gonna get some inf- we're gonna do influencer marketing but how do they know who the talent is where their fan base is what they're really what they really stand for is this somebody how is it evaluated that we know this is a person we want to attach to our most valuable asset which is our brand can I give a Good shallow plug? Oh, yeah. do you want? Yes. So we have software. We've, we've indexed about 13 million channels and around 350 million videos. And it allows you to be able to essentially search for those influencers. So that's what brands are using. They're, if they're looking for a specific um, uh, demographic, they can, they can search that and either by location. And it can tell you what percentage location. of their audience is exactly. in the U.S. Yeah. And it's also good for... Um, individual creators to be able to go out and and find other channels that they can collaborate with. And we had a question back here, sir? Yeah, I was just going to say, I represent the agency that makes all those Geico spots. Oh. Thank you for the plug. Great. I love the chicken. There's the man. And there's a lot of those, con- there's a lot of competitors in that space then for software on these influencers? Uh, you, you, you know, there's, it's, it's, there's a bunch of different vendors. You just sort of pick what you 
want, the, the reality is that you have to do your due diligence. You still have to do some due diligence and things like old fashioned things like, uh, you know, like the software helps us figure out who the top five or 10 might be that we want to do, but the old fashioned due diligence to figure out is this person nuts? Can we work with them? Can we trust them? It still matters and uh, <laughs> do they have their life together because, you know, uh, you know, GUIs in every life, you know, like we still think through some of those things. Um, Incredibly valuable. You can see more and more money. More do you expect to work with them more than once? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and do you end up, does that typically, when you do that, how long is that? I mean, what are some of the longest relationships you have the going on with some of the creators? In our business are a year, right? Like some aspects of the television and traditional media business go expand. So mm -hmm. we're thinking in annual cycles, but if, we're, if we like somebody, then it's in our interest to continue uh, and it's a good relationship. It's a, it's a uh, uh, complimentary relationship, a symbiotic relationship. And we're going to want to continue doing that. Right? Yeah. Some some MCNs have um, issue in the effective. Some of the effective creators tend to get overused, and they, you know. It becomes inauthentic at that point. So that's a balancing act that I think, obviously, creators need to be aware of, MCNs, and then the brands that are doing the advertisers, advertising need to be aware of as well. Let's switch to, uh, the topic over to content for a couple of minutes. So Cliff, my first question's for you on content. With all the content that's out there, with all these guys that are creating content, we're all creating content. What do you do to stand out, to surface among everything? How do you get your content to stand out? Um. Well, the key that I've seen over the years is that a lot of people, they, they may start a YouTube channel, but then they won't really complete it or fill the channel in, so it's really a, a branded channel. And then they may make a video or two or one a month or whatever, but they're not consistently making videos on a scheduled basis. So the key, and then to persevere and to keep continuing to grow your audience especially on and off YouTube and, uh, you know, on all social, but then even the, the traditional forms of, like, news media to get that sort of attention, too. Anybody else have any ideas? Adam, you probably have some ideas on how to make content stand out. Yeah, you've you got to be an authority uh, in, the, uh, in the area that you're making content in. If you're making cooking videos, you better be making cooking videos that are new and... Um, it, recipes that other people aren't doing and um, delivering it in a way that's consumable, uh, not the food itself, but the, the video content. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know, uh, in, inject a lot of personality into it and hope that your personality resonates. I'm always wondering what the difference is between, is it the content or the marketing, right? Is it the chicken or the egg? So like, for example, I make a piece of content called the McCormick Media Minute. It's one minute. It's free. It's sales content. It's help salespeople to be better, right? I got to kill people to sign up. And then when they sign up, when I look at the analytics, four people of the 5,000 you have, four people have actually looked at the video. It's like an unbelievable opportunity that they give us all these tools to create, but still it's up to me to handle all the risks and the funding, wow. the crew. It's still kind of even a gray area where like I can make a production and then it has to first run on my YouTube primary channel and then I can do behind the scenes videos on a secondary channel. But then even if I want to collaborate with another YouTuber in order for them to show it on their channel, they have to sign the agreement and have over 10,000 subscribers. But then it is possible that you can simultaneously release the product off of YouTube platform. But still that's kind of a, even a gray area right now. So it's pretty much primarily everything I do at YouTube is gonna have to be on that one single channel. And even though I have other channels, like I wanna start another channel, you're gonna have to get 10,000 subscribers in order to show the video. But if I wanna send that content out via my CRM to a database, I'm not allowed to do it because it can only be on YouTube. Yeah, I think for now it's really just resides on the channel, but it is possible to get simultaneously released, possibly. We, we have an... Yeah, you have, in order to do that, you, 
like I had to sign a master use agreement, you know, that I'm responsible for like a $25 million Google data center. And basically I had to get insurance and you need, you need all that. Let me get to this gentleman's question. Sorry, I was just going to add to that. Um, I actually work for a traditional, net, traditional network. Which one? Oh, great. Christmas time, everybody. Wonderful. Watch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's getting views like you are. More than more. Um, we were just down in the YouTube space last week. Um, if you ask a production coordinator, there are a lot of little tricky ways that you can get around some of those rules. Yeah. So, yeah, you may only have one day to shoot, but if you plan that day at the end of the month, you can get two days. Yeah. So you're going to shoot at the end of the month or the next day. We actually asked about releasing content on YouTube because we have a network. TV network, why yeah. do you need to do it on YouTube? And literally, I think they said, as long as you release it there first. Yeah. So I said, if oh. I release it on YouTube at 9.50 and 9.52, I release it on Hallmark Channel, am I okay? Nobody's probably going to Yeah, I believe I you can, you have to show it on your primary channel, and then it can be simultaneous released off platform. Very interesting. Yeah. That's you cool. And then there's lots of little things like that where you have to kind of hear and then it may change because they really changed their whole rule book just to, like in August. So things people are doing like bringing extra visitors and stuff, they're really tightening it up. So it, it's always changing. And how much insurance do you, do you say you need to get? Yeah, we're not allowed to like say the, how much the insurance costs, but Google's partnered with Aon out of New York. And so... Basically, you need to get like a, a blanket insurance, which covers 28 webisodes for the year for me. So with studios like Disney backing uh, Maker Studios, is there any threat that big media could eventually absorb this wonderful independent content creator model that we have here, right? Is this <laughs> something we have to worry about for the future? No, I, I think they can exist simultaneously in the same space. There's, yeah, there's big media on YouTube and there has been for a long time and some of them are doing really well. Like, and like Conan's great on YouTube, Fallon's great Fallon on YouTube. Is, what Fallon yeah. has done on YouTube Fallon's is absolutely great. incredible. And yeah. it's been terrific marketing for the channel, yeah. for the for the broadcast channel. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. It gets people tuning in and, and that's good. And it, yeah, I don't think it's like siphoning views away from so like... So it's not one or the other. It's kind of both. I think, I think you're actually, it's, it's even more, it's beyond that. It's a competitive disadvantage if you're in traditional media and you're not taking advantage, if you're not in the space. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because you're, you're missing out on a, on a massive audience that many of which are, you know, they don't have cable. They're not using traditional means to, to view their content. So right. if you yeah. want to get to them, you, yeah, you know, you've got to start it. You got to start at YouTube. So I have another question for the audience and then we're going to come to, you want to ask your question first? You go ahead, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to something Cliff said a little bit earlier about the uh, $100 CPM for YouTube. Well, no, it, what it is is for the going rate for sponsored videos is around a hundred dollars for a thousand views. So if a company came to me and wanted to give me a product to do a sponsored video, the going rates usually now around a hundred dollars per a thousand views. Yeah, you'd say, okay, I can get you ten thousand views, or I can get you thousand views. So you know that's a hundred dollars. Then just two little points. Um, one is. FameBit is FameBit, F-A-M-E-B-I-T, is one of these marketplaces where if you have over a thousand subscribers, you can jack into FameBit through your YouTube channel. And just less than a month ago, they opened up Twitter and Instagram, but you can't get in unless you have a YouTube a thousand YouTube subscribers first. And then you once you come in there, there's an entire marketplace where you pitch the products, like the new hoverboard uh, thing, and they're they're willing to give you you know two hundred fifty dollars to ten thousand dollars to pitch that. The other thing is just to mention, there are a lot of larger companies now that have been coming to YouTube space. So not just the single creators, but like Animal and like Nintendo and Riot Games and, and a lot of live streaming too. So a lot, a, lot, a lot of companies are doing live streaming events. They just have the Star Wars unboxing and all that. So listen, let me ask this question to the audience. Of course, I want to, we want to hear from the panel on what they think, but don't be shy. Raise your hand. What's your opinion of what the future holds for YouTube? <laughs> it looks vast. I think it's unlimited. I want to get involved because I have a very unique concept that 
It's topical around the world, continually hear about it, and nobody's really doing it. And I know okay. the history of what I'm talking about. So I talked to Cliff, and he says, I definitely have something that people will want to see. What else? What do you guys think is the future me, of YouTube? Can I just comment yes. on this? Because yeah. this, this is really what makes this platform yeah. exciting, yeah. is individuals that have, you know, something the, to say. not sure what you're working on, but it, it's going to be very well, specific. Don't tell anybody. Fair enough. <laughs> so you're going to have an audience that is very much interested in that. Yeah. And there may be others that are obviously are not going to be interested in that. And that's the power of this of this platform. The social video power is exciting. And, you know, relative to the future of it, it's it is vast. I think I mentioned early on you're talking about a 13 billion of a 200 billion dollar marketplace. It's it's some people say it's the second inning. It's it's not even it's the bottom of the first. You don't even have Facebook online. Yeah. Right. So you're talking about a doubling of the size of the space when the monetization and the rights management component comes online, 2x overnight like that. So that that's really exciting, I think, all the way around. As what do you guys think? Video. You can you can monetize videos in over 60 countries now, and yeah, it, I mean businesses and has have after I've been on to YouTube for 10 years, and the majority of businesses may not even have a channel or one video. Yeah. They just don't still get it after 10 years, and I mean I'm just waiting. But as the newer generations come along, they are getting it, you know, and they're what getting older. What else do you older. guys think, sir? I want to answer, answer your question with a question, which is you know the implied question is for me is is YouTube so entrenched? Is, is the switching cost of going to another platform or service so high that they're just around forever? Or are they vulnerable to competitors? There's a lot of people who would love to take them down. And that's a, that's a question I wonder about when you ask about their long term. If you have unique content and you're willing to really get it out there, you, you know, YouTube, you've got to be at YouTube. It's, a, it, it's, it's, see, I've built my audiences over the last 10 years from people around the world. And I mean, one, one thing recently was uh, people are doing these sponsor beauty videos. And just last night I was checking that out and seeing a big backlash because some people aren't, don't like that people are doing sponsor videos for videos that they aren't really interested. So it comes down to the passion, the realness, that you really are authentic and you love what you're doing. But then there's an entire world out there that you can reach. And it's all free. You know, you make a video. You know, it's naive to think that there aren't going to be competitors. There are massive competitors. I think the real narrative is the size of the space is dramatically growing. So you have, obviously, Facebook, YouTube, and others that are coming into this space. But the viewership right now and the user base internationally, by far, is on YouTube. And that's the exciting thing about Facebook, because that's obviously a global user base as well. So, huge black hole in China, right? So, now I'm going to ask my panelists, my wonderful panelists, to stick around and answer any questions. We have come to the end of our time, but you guys have been an amazing, amazing engaged audience. I thank you for sticking around with us and for participating. Please give a round of applause to my panel. All right, you guys did great. Thank you. Thanks. Sing one by fast, didn't you?